I just, I don't have the names of the people who are speaking. Sorry, I, I don't have the list. Thanks very much, everybody, for, for coming to join us for the second part of this wider neighborhood discussion. I think we have a very interesting panel, and among my first panels that is like majority female, so that's fantastic. I noticed that uh, the Western European panels this morning did not have such a balance, so um, I think that's great. Um, for those of you that weren't here for the previous panel with um, President Penderovsky, I'm Valerie Hopkins. I am the Southeast Europe correspondent for the Financial Times, um, and it's a big honor to be discussing um, the European neighborhood uh, here on this panel today. I think we have a very broad mandate and a very short period of time. So um, I would like to get going. Thank you very much. So my vocal cords will need that. Um, without much ado, um, so just, I think everybody is aware of everyone in the room. We have um, Bulgarian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ekaterina Zaharyeva here. We have Olga Stefanishina, the Ukrainian Minister for European Integration and Deputy Prime Minister, not to forget. We have Katerina Matanova, who is um, in DG near, very high up, setting the policy. And we have um, also the European Union Special Envoy for Kosovo-Serbia Dialogue. And joining us remotely via video link in Zagreb, uh, we have uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Gordon so welcome. Um, I think I might just uh, start with um, Minister Zaharieva because you are the closest to me um, and there are a <laughs> lot of things I would like to ask you um, but I guess maybe we've, we've just seen um, that this week, the, the rollout of the rule of law reports. Um, your country was, was m mentioned um, as one of the, of one of the countries that, that is experiencing some difficulties with rule of law. At the same time, you have also been one of the countries that has been really, really uh, pushing uh, for the accession of Western Balkan countries, um, bringing them into the region. You'll be hosting in November um, a summit. Um, how are you, I guess I'm asking again, as usual, two questions in one, but, but um, how are you working on cleaning up your own house while um, helping the countries who want to join the EU do the same? Uh, thank you for these questions. I, uh, two questions, you're absolutely right, as always, uh, and I'm happy to be here. And I want to thank the organizers and our uh, host uh, that uh, they uh, managed to organize this forum because, frankly speaking, I really miss, uh, I think, uh, yeah, the last time we were together in Skopje for yes. the Berlin process yes. on 10th of March and after that the lockdown <laughs> happens uh, and I'm really pleased to be here and to be able to discuss again one of my favorite topics and this is the Western Balkans and the region, the neighborhood is not the Eastern Partnership uh, here too. Uh, I think uh, this report uh, uh, was uh, quite objective uh, and uh, I'm really very, very pleased that finally I remember the first discussion about this comprehensive horizontal mechanism for all the member states. Starts many, many years ago, first couple of resolution of the European Parliament, um, which recommended to the European Commission to establish such kind of, and the Council, such kind of mechanism. And I'm happy that we finally, after years and years of debate, we succeed to have such kind of mechanism. Because uh, in your previous panels, we talk a lot about the role of the European Union in the, in the world. And one of the main roles is really the liberal order. And yes, we are not perfect in our house, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to be better. And this mechanism and this report shows where our advantages are, but also where, where, uh, where we have problems and we should be better and work to uh, give the people what they need. And this is perception and feeling to live in justice societies. Uh, so 
Many times when I meet my friends and partners from the countries in the region, not only the Balkans, we have a really, really good discussion with Olga uh, in Kiev a couple of weeks ago, sharing our experience with her about uh, how and what we have done good, and sometimes good advice is what we have done wrong during our pre-accession aspiration. And I think the, the main uh, advantage and good for all the people in the countries is that the reforms always throughout this path are linked with justice, reform, working institutions, uh, and rule of law. So uh, knowing uh, what we have done wrong, I think we are really good supporter of those countries through advices, don't do what we have done wrong. Thank you very much, Mrs. Zaharyeva, and I'm looking forward to coming back to you to touch on some of the things President Pendarovsky said. Um, Minister Stefanishinam, you came here directly after the um, summit with Ukraine, the EU summit with Ukraine. What were you promised? Are you satisfied with, with, with what you got? And, and what can you tell us about what you expect now from the EU? Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, I want to thank, uh, to, to, to bring the spirit uh, that uh, when President landed to Brussels, we had the feeling that 90% of the summit are already successful because all member states were very supportive of our aspirations and uh, uh, ambitions, which we have uh, invested in, in preparation and uh, discussing the final declaration of the summit. So we were pretty happy of the results of the summit even before we, la we, we landed the, the Brussels land. So this this also uh, speaks a lot of the way how it is important to invest in, uh, uh, in uh, sustainability of the dialogue and, and reforms. And this is, was the spirit which we brought and invested into this summit. Uh, but also the second uh, very important um, element is that uh, this summit was very different from the previous ones because it wasn't really a only a political discussion. There, there was a feeling that uh, Ukraine brings itself to Brussels not only with the romantic idea of European integration, we bring ourselves with the concrete proposals and ambitions and suggestions how to really make, think, make sure that European integration, economic integration and political association are really taking place. And uh, we were very largely supported by Ukrainian business, Ukrainian parliamentarians, civil society. Uh, basically all the country prepared the president to make sure that he delivers 100% for the summit. And this support was much stronger than only support for the, for, for the geopolitical idea. It was the support for concrete results results and we were instrumented with so many uh, with uh, so many positive uh, ideas uh, from our stakeholders and it was felt in Brussels and we felt the reciprocity and readiness to engage into a very practical format and uh, another very important thing we were discussing as it is always discussed in a bilateral format, the much broader agenda in the, over the continent and the new policies developed by European Union as the green agenda, the digital agenda, where Ukraine is by default a part of this uh, agenda. And uh, we were also discussing the issue of the Eastern Partnership, while uh, Eastern Partnership is de facto no longer physically uh, existing because uh, uh, it's hardly we can imagine how can we have a successful summit in a situation with Belarus uh, with the acceleration of the conflict over Azer Azerbaijan and Armenia and then uh, many many other things uh, which are happening and destabilizing the countries itself not speaking about the the former uh, and uh, this was something which were uh, uh, put on the table and basically this understanding and understanding that Ukraine is one of the not many countries over the region who are still managing to fight Russian aggression over its ter territory, uh, to uh, face the daily breaches of human rights over the occupied territory of Crimea, still manages to deliver on the reforms agenda and clearly state its European aspirations. So this is something which was uh, very, uh, very important discussed there. And I think that it's like the obvious truth, which is like was spelled out in the first physical summit after the pandemic. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Um, Katerina, do you share this assessment? Is Ukraine delivering and, and what are they getting from the EU in return? <laughs> 
I, I very much uh, share Olga's uh, assessment, and it's great to to uh, be not only on the same panel but also at the same summit two days ago, <laughs> and we uh, collaborate very very uh, closely. Um, indeed, this was the first. A physical summit of beyond the EU borders and uh, so just as an anecdote we, we struggled a little bit with the translation equipment at the beginning which actually broke the ice and uh, and indeed the the atmosphere was uh, extremely uh, positive what Olga was describing is is a phase in our relations with Ukraine which are much less bombastic in terms of political deliveries because we already have an association agreement and uh, the deep and comprehensive free trade area which is uh, really the most complex uh, relationship you can have contractually uh, short of uh, short of uh, enlargement uh, process we have already granted visa liberalization to Ukrainian citizens. So there is what, what now we have on the table is this deeper sectoral integration, which is much less sexy in terms of announceables, but uh, I very much believe uh, very important for the economy and for the citizens of, of Ukraine. So indeed, we discussed how to associate or how to, to make Ukraine be part of uh, the process of both the digital and the, and the green uh, transformation. And uh, we, of course, uh, also shared our concerns on uh, some of the developments, notably around the uh, anti-corruption and uh, judicial reform, which, in my view, uh, is never a linear process. And you always do two steps forward, one step back. So it's not something that one can change institutions overnight. But, uh, but certainly, I would, uh, as I always do to everyone who says that they stopped reforms, just remind that in the span of the COVID pandemic, uh, Ukraine liberalized the land market, adopted a very important banking law, taking on some oligarchic interests in the banking sector head on, uh, on decentralization, made a major step in fiscal decentralization, and something that I think we already talked about in one of the other panels, uh, uh, in fact, unbundled the NAFTA gas, something that uh, the European Union has been pushing Ukraine to do for several years and hasn't happened. And all of this happened in the slower type time of reforms, which was during the COVID. So I still think it's pretty impressive, but uh, as all good friends are uh, critical, we will, of course, uh, be continue pushing Ukraine on the, in the areas where we think that they should, uh, uh, should do more. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lychuk, we've had a very, very dynamic few months um, with regards to, to your bailiwick, Kosovo-Serbia dialogue. I'm wondering, um, how do you see the, the, the letters of intent that were signed in Washington um, last month? Um, and, and how do you see now Washington's role in the dialogue? Is it complementary uh, to yours or is it uh, a bit pursuing its own aims? Thanks. Sorry for asking you a tough one at the beginning. <laughs> Look, from our perspective, uh, we welcome any activity that is uh, here to support the EU-led process, an EU-facilitated process. Because there can be many tracks, but only one track brings uh, Serbia and Kosovo and the rest of the region closer to the European Union. Because our dialogue, our process, uh, EU-facilitated process, is based on EU acquis and on EU, EU standards. So it's not only about normalizing relations between the two parties, but it's also about bringing them closer. No other track can do that. Uh, signing uh, uh, up to the commitment of uh, moving the embassies to Jerusalem is not getting you closer to the European Union. That's one of uh, many examples I can bring. So uh, uh, we have always worked very closely with our US partners. Uh, we need them. Uh, and it has always been very clear and very well understood by everyone uh, that uh, it's the European Union who is in the driver's seat, who is in the lead, because ultimately the goal is the European perspective, European membership. Just a quick 
follow up uh, since you were more brief than 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 our than our previous panelists. Um, I avoided your question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Um, I've had the opportunity in the last few weeks to speak to members of, of both delegations about their trips to Brussels, and I mean, it should be noted, of course, that immediately from Washington, um, after this, um, these meetings in the Oval Office, they came straight to Brussels before going home, right? Uh, but uh, do you really see that there's a willingness um, to, to reach a, a legally binding comprehensive deal on the part of both parties, you know, in the next, during your mandate, shall we say? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. parties don't need to be uh, convinced that the dialogue is good for them. They understand it very well because they are in Europe. They see the future in Europe, in the European Union, and uh, they know very well that uh, the entry ticket is the dialogue. They need to go through the dialogue. They need to normalize their relations so that they can get closer to the European Union. So the good thing is that there is no need to uh, explain this to the parties. And uh, they keep repeating, and rightly so, that there is no alternative to the dialogue. Dialogue is very complicated, obviously, because we are discussing the most difficult issues. Uh, our ambition is that after almost 10 years of the process, we want to bring this, this to the end. That means to sign a comprehensive, legally binding agreement that will solve all outstanding issues once and for all. And here I will echo what the President Pendarovsky said, the uh, agreement that will uh, stabilize the regional atmosphere, and also bring the, the parties closer to the European Union. So it's a huge agenda, but uh, there is no way around it, and, and therefore uh, the parties are committed to it. But uh, we are discussing issues such as uh, mutual financial or property claims. This has never been uh, discussed before, and you can imagine how huge this issue is. Uh, or the issue of the association or community of Serbian municipalities in Kosovo has been signed 2013-2015, never implemented. Now it's time to implement because we, there is nothing for us to wait for. So uh, it is extremely complex and challenging, and therefore uh, it's, it's important that for both Serbia and Kosovo the dialogue is elevated above the daily politics. They understand the strategic importance of the dialogue, and for the European Union uh, to be well aware of the fact that the dialogue is linked to the European perspective. So we must be able to project the perspective in a way that uh, it's credible, it's tangible. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to this topic, um, but I want to include uh, Minister Gurdic Radman. Um, hi. It's a pity you couldn't be here with us today, but it's great that you are joining us via I don't know if it's Zoom or some kind of telelink. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, from the perspective of the Western Balkans 6, um, the green light uh, for opening uh, talks with Albania and North Macedonia um, was one of the key deliverables of your EU presidency that was marked by unprecedented crazy pandemic and, and all of the things that that brought. Um, how committed are you to now seeing that through? And, and will you maintain the commitments and the uh, alacrity with which you worked um, during your presidency on that issue. Thank you. So, hello to everyone and uh, th thank you very much for this question and um, so very, very sorry to, for not being with you, but because of the um, epidemiolo epidemiological measures and uh, uh, special circumstances, actually um, we uh, used or we learned uh, how we could and adjust to the new reality, reality and uh, method of uh, co cooperation. Yes, uh, uh, it was really on, uh, that accepted that um, the uh, accession negotiation with North Macedonia and uh, and Albania would come to fruitful uh, to success, uh, although in the October uh, a year ago starting with a new methodology because we didn't actually got the unanimous uh, uh, we didn't decide it unanimously uh, among the European Union to start actually without any and doubt uh, or any any objections uh, with the with these two countries uh, then according to the new methodology um, the next day, uh, just we we tried, or in next uh, months, uh, to uh, to convince all the countries uh, of the European Union, or some skeptical uh, countries, just you know, that how it's important uh, there, um, that uh, a message for these two countries. Uh, first of all, North Macedonia really. Um, uh, 
food field, uh, the, the, all the criteria uh, were necessary for, and Albania also made a progress. Uh, and we thought that uh, it would be really a good also message uh, from the psychological point of view also, not only, but for the, uh, when it comes to the, to the stability, functionality, uh, democracy, uh, rule of law, and the message of, for the, all the, these countries, uh, I think so that uh, we, we thought that it will be really a good uh, message and good stop, step forward to start accession negotiation with these two countries. And we uh, succeeded uh, to, uh, to get a, a decision on, in March uh, this year and then, of course, also according to the very good, posit, posit, positive uh, report uh, given by the European Commission on 2nd March uh, this year. And I do remember that so my first visit after that, or, or at the same time, I visited in one day uh, 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 as well as an, uh, uh, Albania then, and North Macedonia. It was really you know, for us an, a good uh, message and for us, we were so happy. Croatia they, uh, strongly supported uh, Albania and North Macedonia. Of course, now um, this um, the, actually the next step, uh, uh, the, the next key step, actually the adoption of the uh, of the negotiation frameworks and actually the, the holding uh, of first uh, so-called IGS in intergovernmental uh, uh, conference uh, with these two countries. Um, we expect that uh, this uh, conference will be held on the to the end of the German presidency to the end of the of the year. Of course, our our full full support uh, to these uh, two countries. I know that all the members of the European Union and surrounding countries that would like to support these two countries and. Uh, uh, even uh, for Serbia, for Bosnia and Herzegovina, for uh, Montenegro, it's really also and a good message also to continue their their reforms. Actually, they could, according to the new methodology, they also could could. Uh, continue their way, but they can choose actually because of their um, some practical or, or technical moments uh, uh, when it comes to the new methodology and uh, that they can also use also this way. And uh, of course, I would like also to mention the recent report uh, of the European Commission um, which gives an, us an, uh, an overview of the progress made not only by these uh, six countries, but uh, also the, the Turkey as well. So seven countries of the uh, Southeast Europe. Uh, but uh, I would like to use the opportunity and uh, because you know that uh, Croatia, it's in the Croatian's uh, immediate neighborhood and we have experience, we have an, uh, because of the common history, we shared common history more than 70 years and uh, the Bosnia and Herzegovina, we shared uh, the common border more than 1000 kilometers. The report um, actually in the part related to this in a country, you know, that uh, it's really in a very complex uh, countries, uh, notes the need uh, also to resolve uh, political questions and uh, that will actually unlock its potential on the, on the path of reforms and Euro, Euro integration. It is really necessary uh, for the functionality and the stability of these countries to eliminate all forms of uh, political inequality among the three nations of Bosnia and Herzegovina, namely uh, Bosniaks, Serbs and, and Croats, and reform the existing election law. Uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Lajčak Miro knows uh, because he is really expert, uh, well uh, known expert uh, to this region and happy to see him and to, to greet him. And also I uh, support, we support Croatia, support dialogue between Prishina and Belgrade, but I think so it is not there, um, it, is, it, it is good start, but so we didn't uh, solve all the problems uh, uh, 
which uh, we are expecting or look forward for this country to engage even more uh, actively uh, to overcome their um, differences. And I think so once they uh, will uh, uh, open the, the really uh, concretely dialogue politically and economically, I think so there are, we, we will see the, the, the light on the end of the, of, of the tunnel. We know very well how is the stability, how is the functionality, democracy, rule of law important in this region. This region, we don't like that this region should be uh, uh, so hum, some, to some extent Ill, the, the black hole, you know, in Europe. You know that uh, we opened and we put it on our uh, high agenda, first of all, the, the enlargement uh, of uh, Western Balkan and the Eastern Partnership. And we are very fro proud to the fact that so the so-called Zagreb Declaration was issued uh, uh, during our EU presidency uh, in May this year. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister. I want to come back to you about, about this and about Bosnia. We're going to have another round. Um, I will open the floor to questions soon because I see a lot of people who are very interested in the region and experts. But first, I want to do one more blitz lightning round, uh, picking up from, from some of the other things that we've heard from the panel. So, Minister Zaharieva, um, you, Bulgaria used your presidency of the European Council to convene the so SOFIA summit, as we mentioned, um, but I just want to get a little bit more into the specific issues now. I, I spoke to some people in Skopje uh, recently, and, and, and they're very worried that, you know, there was so much support coming from SOFIA throughout the whole negotiations, throughout the whole PRESPA process, and now that, that, that it will be stopped. Do you think that it, there's a chance that the, the, the current challenges might reverse the role that, that you were playing as a, as a champion for, for North Macedonia? Thanks. Yeah, Valerie, you, thank you that you mentioned our presidency. And I really remember very well, six months before our presidency start, when we were um, consulting and formally our plans for our priorities with our partners in the Union, with the commissioners, with the President of the Council. Everybody was advising us, don't put so much in focus the European perspective of the Western Balkans, because it's not popular. It, you are not going to meet so much big support from other member states. But we thought that who else, if the neighboring country in first presidency after we joined the European Union, uh, will be able to convince, knowing the region very well, to convince the others that it's a win-win. It's as much important for us, European member states, to support and help the Western Balkans as for them. And I'm really happy that so much, two and a half years later, everybody who is the next president feel obliged that to talk about the Western Balkans, to mention that this is the main priority. I'm thankful to the Croatian friends for Zagreb summit, because a Sofia summit was planned. And we really hope that every two years we will have a Balkan summit every two years. So I'm happy to the Zagreb Declaration. I'm happy to the president, German presidency. So on your concrete question, we were the first country that recognized the Republic of North Macedonia, the first one. We uh, were always one of the strongest supporters of the Republic of North Macedonia and the other Balkan countries on their European aspiration. And uh, in every declaration adopted by our leaders, the good neighborly relationship is mentioned as one of horizontal criteria. And uh, there are some remaining open, not unsolved questions. But I'm sure and I'm convinced that on the both sides of the border, there is a political will to solve these problems. And that's why we create this commission from people, from academia, because sometimes we put this open question so much only on the political sides of the, of the, the, the coin. But they should be also historical truth here. 
And that's why we think that academic and professionalists should be also be part of this process. And uh, I can imagine that if the people from the both sides of the border could understand each other without translation, how hard could be not to reach agreement on the still open questions? I'm sure that we will succeed. Are you and to tomorrow, as uh, the president said, uh, I will meet my colleague, uh, Vujar Osmani, the new foreign minister, but I know him, of course, because they changed their places with Nicola, to discuss and uh, uh, to, uh, I hope, have some um, success uh, of uh, the open questions. And I'm sure that with good faith, we are... Um, Thank you very much. We work to solve them. I wish you both success. Um, Minister Stefanishina, we, we had an interesting discussion uh, earlier today when we met where you were saying that, uh, that there is no more Balkans and Eastern Europe, that, that the region and the concept of the wider neighborhood is changing. And we, I, we're, we are already running short on time, but, but I wonder if you could sort of elaborate how you see the, the region and the neighborhood from, from your perspective in Kyiv. Uh, well, thank you, Partially, I already uh, said some messages about that in my previous uh, uh, intervention. Basically, uh, over the last years, we had so, such an intensive discussions with the European member states and with the EU about the future of European partnership, uh, deliverables 20 to 20, more for more principle, etc., etc. And uh, Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia, we were strong in our messages related to more differentiated approach and three plus format, etc. And like uh, two years after, we're nowhere in this discussion. And uh, now we see that uh, the, uh, the pandemic, the um, uh, new developments in terms of uh, um, uh, conflict situations uh, over the region of Eastern Partnership, they have put in everything on its place. So it's clear and obvious for everybody that we should reinvent the, the way how we are uh, running the region. Ukraine is ready to pioneer and to lead this project uh, because Ukraine is the biggest country over basically the continent. Uh, uh, Ukraine uh, is uh, the most uh, development and the only EU, 100% in and NATO oriented country and we're ready to conceptually lead this pro uh, process. But uh, uh, once again, uh, and we had a short discussion today with the uh, His Excellency President of, uh, of Northern Mac Macedonia that uh, we have pretty a lot of common. Those countries who are really line, uh, running towards EU and NATO integration, we have so many uh, common issues in our bilateral agenda on the economic integration, on the screening of the reforms, and we're going through the same challenges by transforming the uh, old uh, old systems and uh, moving towards the rule of law, the, the anti-corruption, the reforms of judiciary, the reforms of the law enforcement and, uh, and the spirit in bringing us closer to the Standard. So we share the, sp the same spirit and basically historically we're in absolutely different reality. And uh, I think that uh, uh, now when uh, European Union is about to jump two levels higher in this development with the new, uh, very ambitious agenda related to what I've said, new uh, approach toward economic development, new approach to, toward uh, digital agenda, and the new normal related to pandemic and comment and, and uh, COVID-19. So we should reinvent that together, or we, and we cannot be go lagging behind and put ourselves in a, flame or a framework of uh, 10 or 20 years uh, back uh, in, in the geopolitical reality. So we should adjust ourselves. And as our president is saying, Ukraine will anyhow be successful and blossoming. And uh, we can make it sure that it's not only Ukraine, it is the whole region and the whole continent. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Uh, Ms. Matanova, um, in your previous remarks, uh, you, you spoke about uh, the, the Euro-Atlantic uh, commitment of Ukraine and, the, and the, the willingness and ability to make these reforms. But I want, I want to now kind of continue this geopolitical discussion that, that we opened and ask about the timing and ask a little bit about Serbia, um, if you don't mind, unless you want to pass it over to your colleague. Um, 
you know, uh, CSIS just published a new report saying that Serbia, calling Serbia a client state of China, um, sort of worrying and worrying about diminishing um, European influence as, as the economies of, of Serbia and China become more intertwined. And I'm wondering if, if you see Serbia specifically as one of the places where uh, the EU really needs to sort of assert more of its um, authority and, and economic might in the same way that, that, that Washington did uh, last month. Well, I think that Europe needs to assert its authority and presence in the whole Western Balkan regions. And I think that uh, Europe needs to assert its authority and presence and investment throughout the broader neighborhood. And uh, I think that uh, we try to do that uh, also with the COVID crisis. As you will remember that in March, uh, you know, uh, there, were, there were in fact uh, banners in, uh, in Serbia talking about uh, how China is helping uh, more than anyone else. We were able to, in fact, prove that narrative wrong and successfully show that it actually has been the European Union that, uh, that stood there. So I, I think that uh, what is important is that uh, we actually uh, hold the countries to a standard, as we do. On Tuesday, we published a new uh, enlargement report. But uh, as uh, President Penderovsky was saying, we also published uh, our investment plan, which is a serious determination to bring the economies of the Western Balkans closer to the European average. And we are putting their emphasis on really long-term long-term growth path of these countries and I think that's the way to win hearts and minds in addition to uh, the push on reforms and the discussions and the fundamentals whether it's rule of law whether it's public administration the economic development is in 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 my view as fundamental as uh, as everything else so I would I would uh, uh, leave it at that but if I if you allow me uh, just want to react to something that uh, Olga alluded to in this intervention as well as previous one I'm not as pessimistic on the Eastern Partnership framework as uh, you might have uh, uh, seen because I think it's particularly now with all the uh, commotion that's happening in the region that we stay engaged that we stay engaged with all the six countries uh, that we uh, are in clear discussion across the sectors across the areas where where we where we are involved that doesn't mean that we cannot have a deeper integration with ukraine we can we do we had a separate summit with you but i i very much hope that uh, that your skepticism about the eastern partnership is not going to be uh, born out uh, with reality. I very much hope that we will be able to put a solid dialogue with all six on a proper footing ahead of the March uh, planned March uh, Eastern Partnership Summit. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Leitrak, I want to ask you a similar question, I guess, uh, which is, you know, um, does Serbia's kind of patronage by Beijing and Moscow um, and now it's even growing ties to Washington, um, make your job a bit more difficult, you know, when, when Kosovo relies so much on Washington and is still sort of uncertain about the EU because of the non-recognizers, including this country that we're all in today. Um, does that make your job a bit more difficult in that, uh, you know, there's a lot of unequal um, bargaining power there? Oh, there is nothing wrong in having uh, normal political communication and economic cooperation with anyone, including Moscow or Beijing. That's fine. But uh, the precondition is that you make it very clear that the European integration is your uh, priority. And not only verbally, but also by deeds. That means you act uh, accordingly. And uh, now, I mean, this is also the, the COVID uh, foreign policy discussion. I mean, the, all countries of the region understand very well uh, who is their friend and who helped them. And I'm in regular contact with leaders of the Western Balkans countries. And what I heard from every one of them was we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to survive without the assistance of the European Union. 3.3 billion euros uh, uh, dedicated to the region. There were other, other players uh, sending one or two planes, a uh, lot of PR, but you cannot compare this. So, uh, therefore, 
European Union is pretty busy with so many challenges, but uh, honors its commitment uh, towards its neighborhood, both the Western Balkans and Eastern Partnership. But we need to be convinced by those par partners that they are serious. We cannot lie to each other, we cannot pretend that we, uh, we are walking towards the European Union and at the same time make steps in, in the opposite direction. Because then you m cannot be surprised that the enthusiasm on the side of the European Union is, is fading. So we, we need a new momentum. Right now, uh, yeah, I mean, there is not much enthusiasm, neither on the side of the Western Balkan countries, not when it comes to the, uh, the rhetoric, but when it comes to the, uh, the reforms. And you also don't see that much enthusiasm on the side of the European Union, because what I hear from my partners in the EU is they are not serious, they don't really mean it. They are, they are telling us something, but they, this is not what they really do. So that's why uh, European Union is a clear leader uh, in their effort. Uh, obviously, we are he helping them a lot, but we need to see a strong commitment. So uh, th that's what I, I said once, that you cannot march in several directions at the same time. So you have to have your priorities clear and right. And the fact is that President Vucic told me that uh, the government he's about to appoint is going to be the most pro-EU government in Serbia's history, and that program will be very pro-EU. So I really hope that we, we are going to see this very soon. I um, will eagerly be watching the composition of the new government. Um, Minister Zahareva, you wanted to jump in on this point, or yeah, shall I go I first to... One sentence um, uh, about uh, perception in those countries, and uh, Miru mentioned PR. I, I would not say it's only PR, it's propaganda. And uh, the, if the, two years ago, I watched some data from Serbia, 80% of the people think that Russia is the biggest investor in. Number one is Russia, number two is China, European Union number three. The reality is absolutely not the case. European Union is the biggest investor, two or three times bigger than the two others. And it's part of the propaganda. I think, as Miro rightly said, the leaders of those countries also have some responsibility to explain the truth, but we also should be more active as European Union. So I would say we should improve our PR too. Thank you so much. Okay, we almost have only 10 minutes left for audience questions, so I feel very guilty about hugging this and abusing my period. But before you stand up with a heavy microphone, I just wanted to go to Minister Grlic Radman and ask you, you started uh, to talk about uh, the need for reforms in Bosnia um, and, you know, Min, uh, for, uh, Prime Minister Plankovic has said on many occasions that one of the biggest uh, foreign policy priorities that, that he has, that Croatia has, is, is Bosnia-Herzegovina, is uh, uh, working for the Croats. Um, and now I've seen a lot of observers worry, especially with the meeting uh, between President Milanovic and uh, Milorad Dodik, that, that Croatia is not necessarily playing a completely positive role in Bosnia. And I just want to ask you to reflect on or that or perhaps push back on it you know, as we approach the 25th anniversary of the Dayton Peace Agreement. Thanks. Yeah. And Thank you very much. Brief, and, uh, I know it's complicated, but if you could please be brief so that we can have well, some questions for the audience. First of all, Bosnia-Herzegovina is uh, uh, recognized, like uh, Ekaterina said, for um, Macedonia, but uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina was recognized by, by Croatia. Croatia was the first uh, country to recognize independence of Bosnia-Herzegovina. I know the Bosnia-Herzegovina is really, is really in a complexity and uh, uh, not, not easy state in, in, their, in, in the form that uh, uh, for example, such as, uh, as a multinational, multi-ethnical miniature, like for example in Belgium, Switzerland, uh, or somewhere others, and should also to have an also special uh, approach. The uh, Bosnia Herzegovina uh, regarding the when it comes to to the Aten agreement, but Aten agreement is not uh, a novelty when it comes to the Constitution uh, three nations principle. Of course, uh, it uh, it is uh, it has a really a long history uh, um, in, in the political, political and, and constitutional framework of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Formally, in Shred, uh, for example, in the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina, could you imagine 1963, uh, all subsequent constitution, Bosnia and Herzegovina 1974 to 1993. And actually, the, the stability and functionality uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina will be uh, ensured only if there is an, uh, the 
the equality uh, of course of their inequality of their of their peoples to the nation is, is Bosnia Herzegovina guaranteed and respected. And uh, your question, Mr. Dodik, uh, Mr. Dodik is a representative of uh, Serbs, the uh, one of the uh, members of the pres pres pre pres presidency. There are three members of the presidency, and unfortunately, uh, these three presidents, uh, three members of presidency. Uh, do not uh, uh, reflect the, the Croatian representatives because they are outnumbered uh, by other, uh, for example, Bosniaks and Croatians in Bosnia Herzegovina don't have their representatives in the in the presidency. Uh, I think it's the problem, and uh, Mr. Lajčak uh, knows very well that first of all, the decision, uh, the uh, the. Uh, according to, 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 to the constitution should be uh, the impl implemented and of course the ele election law and to guarantee parity and of course that every uh, every nation, every people could uh, choice their own representative, representatives on all levels of their uh, of the authorities in Bosnia Herzegovina. But uh, Dodik was also the, the um, part of the delegation uh, invited to Mr. Borrell as well uh, one week ago. Actually, uh, Dodik visited Croatia, but uh, uh, later on also was in Croatia, visited Bakir Izetbegovic and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Bisera Turkovic, together also with the, with the uh, representative of uh, the biggest Croatian uh, party in, in Bosnia Herzegovina, Dragan Čović. Uh, actually, we always pledged for a dialogue and we are uh, for dialogue ready and I think so to improve uh, to strengthen uh, cooperation when it comes to the to the to the topics of the common interest should be actually the, the, the fact and the, in in our neighborhood and I think so uh, I, I don't see any, any problem you know in this regard Thank you. I, I, I think we could have a whole panel just about this, or even probably like a number of yeah, should, specifically about this but, issue. Uh, of course, um, yeah. But I just don't want to abuse the fact that this is my pet interest, so I would like to finally uh, open the floor to audience questions. We have less than seven minutes. We have um, people going around with very large and heavy microphones, which is why I would ask you to make sure that uh, your question is a brief interrogative statement. Uh, ending in a question mark, um, but I don't see any hands. After all this rushing that I did. Well, actually, the microphone is also part of the new normal. It's true. Look at yeah. this. I was at a conference last week that where the microphones were wearing masks. It was very cute. Um, and nobody has a question. I mean, I have loads of questions. I'm happy to continue, but, uh, but I... <laughs> well, there, there is a question for him, but it's a bit esoteric. If you promise to be brief, uh, Minister Radman, <laughs> I will pose this question to you, uh, which comes from Anton Martvan, who wants to know uh, why Croatia uh, does not recognize the territory between Serbia and Croatia called Liberland. It, it, do you have a very brief uh, response to that? <laughs> And what about the, the, the European, uh, actually we, we follow the, the, the policy, we are Europeans. That was very brief, the briefer, than I thought, briefer than it took me to find my spare questions which I wrote. Um, on we are Europeans. Of paper. Where are they? Let's see now, here we go. Aha, well actually, my other spare question was also for you. <laughs> After I interrupted you on Bosnia, I wanted to ask you a little bit. Um, Herzegovina. Oh, excuse Please, me, yes. Yes. Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina. Thank you for correcting and me. I am by origin, I, I was born in Herzegovina. My <laughs> it's a beautiful well. region. It's one of my favorites, and I had the so pleasure to be there this July. You know so I have, I, I have two homelands. Like many people, I think, who, who, who have Croatian passports. Um, what I wanted to ask you was ab about the recent trip of um, Secretary of State Pompeo in Croatia. As we can see, I'm sorry that I'm American and I keep asking all these questions about American foreign policy, but um, you know, uh, the uh, Washington convinced um, both Kosovo and Serbia to, to avoid these 5G uh, vendor, uh, with potentially harmful, potentially untrusted vendors, excuse me. Um, and I noticed that 
uh, Croatia did not sign a similar agreement, and I, and I also wanted to ask if you have any inside info for us, maybe about the port of Rijeka, um, which is something I'm following as well, which is up for a Chinese concession since we were um, talking about Serbia's relationship to China. Um, look, thank you very much for this question. You know that with the U.S. Uh, we share, uh, uh, we have a lot of common. It's European, not only Croatian, but it's European and the, the most important strategic uh, uh, partner when it comes uh, to the, for the security. We are also a member of NATO and uh, uh, we were so pleased and delighted to uh, see and uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary of State in Croatia. And uh, my first sent sentence was, welcome to Dubrovnik. Uh, the Dubrovnik Republic of Dubrovnik was one of the first republics to recognize the young uh, United States of America in 18th century, and uh, of course he he expressed his uh, his uh, gratitude uh, for that. You know how is the Croatian diplomacy and the Dubrovnik uh, the, the history and uh, and diplomacy uh, so has a long uh, tradition. Of course, the pictures, the photos uh, told more than words, but uh, we. Um, we spoke um, such as not only bilateral but regional and, and, and on the global issue. Uh, we put emphasis, uh, emphasis and uh, first of all for us was the very important uh, to, uh, to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Se uh, Secretary of State because of their ap applicants, uh, ap applicants for the visa, uh, visa liberalization, uh, so-called visa waiver program and uh, we are one of the, of the so the number of the countries in European Union who has an, uh, who should to apply for visa, but uh, so we look forward to be elaborate in in the near future, and then of course uh, to uh, to sign the agreement on avoiding of the double taxation. It's very important for the business community, uh, for investors, and uh, of course for tourists, for everyone. Uh, I think so. It was the the main topics on our uh, agenda. Thank but you. We were not ask to, to, to sign anything and Thank you. change our view. I'm afraid I have to interrupt you because we have now only two minutes and in fact I have one more really big topic that I wanted to discuss before we welcome Svetlana Tikhanouskaya to the stage um, and that is that before this um, terrible um, pandemic called COVID, uh, at least at my newspaper, the biggest issue that we were planning to write about and focus on was the problem of demography and, and movement. And I wanted actually to turn to you, Madam Minister, um, all over your region and the regions that are represented here, you have a massive um, uh, pop shrinking population and emigration. And I'm wondering, especially now with the movement of doctors and nurses and medical personnel uh, to the West in the hopes of getting bigger salaries, and, and you see that you know your state invests, pays for the education, trains people, I'm, and you don't need to focus only on, on doctors and nurses, but, but how, what kind of policies is your government pursuing to try to reverse uh, the demographic decline in, in, in your country. Oh, Valerie, this is not a question and I'm for sorry, one, I see one minute one and minute. For 11 seconds. Uh, but uh, again, link with European integration. Uh, the biggest loss during these 30 years for the region was uh, the people who left the region. It was really difficult for 10 years after the changes, after 1989. And um, what all the governments, I think, should do in the region, and my too, uh, it's to create a ground of people to start to come back. And you know, Valerie, what happened during this awful pandemic? Only for a month, 200,000 people, 200, people from Europe, Bulgarians, came back. That means that they feel safe in Bulgaria. And this is really a remarkable sign. When you feel threatened, you decide to come back home. So, improve the... Uh, and it's not only about uh, the, the, the infrastructure. We should improve all type of infrastructure, education, healthcare systems. Of course, salaries are very important. But I think people want to live in justice uh, and um, in good environment for their children. This is what I think will, um, first of all, m make some people, some of them, I'm not an uh, uh, unrealistic person, 
that some of the people to come back home. Thank you very much for, for ending on this somber but optimistic note. Um, I want to thank the panelists, I want to thank the audience for, for being here, and I presume you all want to stay here because um, Svetlana Tikhanuska will take the stage in about five minutes. So if you need to refresh yourself, please do so, but, but be back here in five minutes. And thank you again to the panel. Thank you very much.